Welcome back to the Fill Our Hearts series on the Dominican Saints. My name is Sister John Thomas, and today I get to talk to you about Dominican women saints under the title of Rich in Purity of Life. And so I wanted to talk to you about that topic and ask the question, what does their Dominicanness have to do with their saintliness? Or how did they live that Rich in Purity of Life title um, specifically as members of the Order of Preachers. And so you may know that the Dominican motto is veritas, or truth, which we know truth is the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and what is this uh, link between truth and a richness and purity of life? Well, there's a beautiful passage in the letter of St. Peter, the first letter of St. Peter, where he says, by obedience to the truth, you have been purified for a genuine love of your brethren. Therefore, love one another constantly from a pure heart, or some translations say, from a sincere heart. And so St. Peter, in that first letter, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, shows us that there's a link between truth and living in obedience to the truth and our ability to love in a pure, rich way. And these Dominican women saints that we're going to explore really did that um, in a beautiful way, in a way that can inspire us and give us an imitation, a uh, way to model our lives on their richness uh, in purity. And this truth purifies us and prepares us to love because St. Peter shows us that these qualities of love are connected to truth. So he uses the adjectives genuine, constant, pure, and sincere. And that type of truth prevents us from the selfishness and the fear that would distort our love. And it helps us to overcome those tendencies to actually distort reality to serve like a selfish need, like a, a need that, um, or a, a fear of insecurity and our need to control. But if we're obedient to the truth, then we're able to kind of surrender those things, to let go of my plans, or my fears or my insecurities, and to be able to open ourselves up to a radical way of loving, to go out of ourselves and encounter the truth in reality, and to be able to be transformed by that truth and purified for the freedom to love. And so when we explore these Dominican saints, we're gonna look at how truth, certain truths shaped their lives and enabled them to live a life rich in purity and rich in love. So we could ask ourselves, what type of truth is it that purifies them to be able to love in this way? Well, it's not necessarily like a truth that's just a list of facts or information like you might get in a news feed or the type of knowledge that you would find in textbooks or encyclopedias, but the truth that purifies us and prepares us to love are those deepest truths that are written into our very nature. Who we are and why we're here. Our nature as made in the image and likeness of God and our purpose as being called to become saints. And when we live in those deep truths, we have that incredible freedom to love. And the lives of these Dominican women saints are marked by two other qualities, humility and boldness. Because they're living in the truth they're not afraid of their weakness. So they have this incredible humility. They know that on their own, they, can't, they can do nothing. But they also have this amazing and radical boldness, this freedom of spirit, because they're also not afraid of their greatness, because they know that God can do great things in them and that he wants to make them saints. So I think those are two qualities that when we look at these um, Dominican women saints, that we can um, find a link between living in the truth that is a specifically Dominican emphasis and charism, and how that enables them to live that out in humility and boldness. And they were very, very free to be themselves. So we could also say that these Dominican women saints were rich in variety of life. So what I wanted to do for you today was to give you just kind of an overview of a few uh, Dominican women saints and invite you to explore more of them on your own, and then highlight two that we're gonna look at towards the end. So if you can see behind me is a portrait, is a painting of the Dominican family or a sampling of the Dominican saints 
In 2016, we celebrated the 800th anniversary of the Dominican Order, and this painting was commissioned to honor that celebration, and it shows a variety of Dominican saints, and among them, eight women Dominican saints and blesseds. So I thought I could point them out to you. I think the image will also appear at the end of this if you want to look more closely, because it will probably be hard to see from where you are, but I'll point them out for future reference. So the first in this lineup is Blessed Amelda. She's from Italy. She lived in the uh, early 14th century. She's probably our youngest saint uh, of the Dominican order. She uh, was able to wear the habit when she was pretty young and died when she was eight years old. She's the patron saint of First Communicants. She had a great devotion to the Eucharist. So feel free to explore her more. Next to her is one of our featured saints for later in the talk, Saint Zetislava Burka. And she was of a noble race and she actually heard the, about the Dominicans first from Saint Hyacinth. So if you've been listening to all of our Fill Your Hearts talk series, you learned from Sister Anne Hyacinth about him. So it's a beautiful connection that the saints influence each other and we can help each other to become saints. Next to her is Blessed Ingrid of Sweden. She was also married uh, shortly thereafter she was widowed, so she was widowed pretty young and then became a Dominican nun. Um, and so she um, also had a connection to a saint. saint. She was related to Saint Bridget of Sweden. And she herself was the first Dominican nun in Sweden, so she brought that charism to her, her native country. And then if we go a little further over, we see Saint Rose of Lima, and she was in Peru, and she was also contemporary with Saint Martin of, Cor Saint Martin de Porres and Saint Juan de Sias. So it's kind of neat to see these saint clusters and how they helped each other onto holiness. She was known for her um, intense penance and also her incredible love and care for the poor. And if we go over onto this side, we see St. Catherine of Siena, probably our most famous uh, Dominican female saint. She's a doctor of the church, a mystic who um, encouraged us to dwell in the cell of self-knowledge, to really know ourselves, but also God's love for us. And then God called her um, out of the privacy of her home and into this incredible public um, active ministry where she traveled all over Europe, was speaking to popes and, and uh, other prelates and people, uh, wielding an incredible amount of influence because of the Lord working through her. Next to St. Catherine, we have St. Margaret of Hungary. Uh, she was uh, also from a noble family, like uh, some of the other saints we've encountered. Her parents were the king and queen of Hungary, and she was at a very young age. Um, brought to the convent and so she was in the convent and yet never took advantage of her royal status In fact quite the opposite. She always wanted to do the humblest work and on Holy Thursday She would um, buy for the opportunity to be the one to wash the feet of her sisters and all of the servants as well So very humble soul And then right behind her is a, another one of our featured um, Blesseds for the day blessed Margaret of Costello. She's holding in her hands a heart with three pearls in it. And we'll talk about that when we focus on her in a little bit. And then the last one in the lineup is Blessed Emily Vicchieri. And she uh, was from Italy as well. And her, uh, she lived in the early 14th century. She lost her mother when she was young and therefore developed a beautiful devotion to Our Lady, to Mary as her own mother. Um, and she also had a devotion to the passion so you could see the wounds on her hands in that image and the crown of thorns around her head. So there's a great variety among the Dominican women saints and they each have something um, to, to teach us and, to, and a way to inspire us, but ultimately they're just kind of like our, our companions, our friends, our cheerleaders, they're rooting us on and um, encouraging us to fulfill our way of being saints. So the, the beautiful thing about looking at different saints is you come to see there's no one mold. God has called each one of us to a unique way of becoming a saint. So we'll just look at two among the many Dominican women saints and blesseds. Saint Zetislava Burka. So she was the one here. She was holding a shield, her family crest. Her uh, family name means Birchwood, so that's on her crest. She was from a wealthy family and a noble family in what is now the Czech Republic, born in 1220. And her family was also imparted to her the richness of the faith. So when she was very young, she had a deep spiritual life. 
In fact, she tried to run away at the age of seven to live in the forest and become a hermit, but God had other plans for her holiness, so she was even willing to surrender her idea of what it meant to be holy and what her sainthood would look like, and she returned to her family home, and her parents arranged a marriage for her to the Count of Lemberg. So she was married, she, had, uh, she bore him four children and raised them. Um, she was wealthy, but tried to continue to practice her penance and poverty. She had a lot of devotional practices and spiritual practices, as well as charity. So you know, a lot of charity towards the poor and the sick in the area. And probably, probably the greatest cross of her life was that her husband did not fully understand her um, either her religious devotion or her charity towards the poor, and he didn't appreciate it. In fact, was often trying to oppose it. And um, one incident um, was that she would welcome the poor and refugees into the castle, and he heard once that she was tending to a beggar in their own bed. And he was very upset by this, and so he was determined to go in and remove the beggar from their bed, forcefully if necessary. But when he walked in, instead of finding the beggar on the bed, he saw an image of Christ crucified. And so after that, his heart softened and his mind changed, and instead of opposing her works, she was able to gradually bring him along to be able to support the works that she did on behalf of the poor. And looking at her life, I think one of the truths that her life embodies, the truths that shaped her, her saintliness, was that truth that all is a gift. Everything that we have, we receive from God, and therefore, we're called to share it with others. So that uh, dynamic of mercy, because everything is a gift, we have to be merciful to others in return. And her life really embodies both the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. So they lived in a time when there were a lot of raids, Tartar raids or Mongol raids, and people were displaced from their land, and so they sought refuge. She, made the castle a place of refuge, so she welcomed the stranger. And so many poor and needy, she, they were able to build a hostel for pilgrims to, to shelter the, the homeless and caring for their needs for food and drink, their bodily needs. Um, and she also welcomed or visited prisoners. So she would go and even intercede for them if they were especially unjustly in prison, and she would intercede on their behalf. So she um, did the corporal works of mercy, and then also the spiritual works of mercy. So if you think the instruct the ignorant and counsel the doubtful and comfort the afflicted, she did all of those things for the people who came into the castle. She was known to instruct her servants' children in the faith. So she gave them their catechesis and instructed them in the faith. She also, in relation to her husband, if you think of those spiritual works of mercy, to bear wrongs patiently and to forgive injuries. So a big part of her married life, she had to practice those spiritual works of mercy, and they all worked towards his conversion. And even that spiritual work of mercy that we sometimes find hard to practice, the one that says to admonish the sinner, she did it in such a beautiful way that it affected his conversion. One of the, some versions of the account of him encountering the beggar as Christ crucified says that she was actually the one who took the beggar out of the bed and put a crucifix there to kind of teach him the reality of what she was doing. So whether it was a miraculous vision or whether she herself had placed an image of Christ crucified in the place where the beggar had been, it was her acts of charity that admonished him in a, in a positive way to see the reality of, what, of the charity that she was doing and eventually to convert his heart. And that another spiritual work of mercy that she embodied was to pray for the living and the dead. And when she herself was on her deathbed, her husband and her children were mourning that they were going to be losing their uh, mother and he, his wife. And she said not to worry because she would pray for them once she got to heaven. So there she was practicing a spiritual work of mercy um, even in her passing from this life. So that truth that everything that we've received is a gift and a mercy and that in order to even receive that, we have to share it with others, is the truth, the spiritual truth that um, Saint Zedislava really embodied in her life. And the next saint that we'll look at is really blessed, Blessed Margaret of Costello. So she um, was 
from a noble family and a wealthy family, but had a very different experience of childhood than Zetislava did. So her parents were hoping for a boy, a male heir, and they did not receive that. So when she was born, um, she was not only a girl, um, but she was blind and lame. She had, hunch, she had a hunchback and um, she never grew. I think when they exhumed her body, she was four feet tall total. So she was very short and small. And they could tell when she, when she was born that, um, that these deformities would, would last. And so they were, her parents were so shocked by this um, that they actually told everybody that the, that the baby died in childbirth. They were so embarrassed by their daughter that they decided to lock her away in a room in the castle and let nobody visit her or even know about her. So she grew up rejected by her parents and suffering incredible isolation from human love and human affection. And it occurred to me as I was reflecting on her life how much a saint she could be for our times, especially for anyone who is experiencing that isolation or loneliness because of being restricted and um, unable to, to be with other people. So um, she could be a special patron for those suffering from the isolation of the pandemic or, or just the epidemic of loneliness that is in our society um, because she did not feel alone. Even though she was rejected by her parents, she knew that she had the presence of God. She didn't have her parents' love, but she had God's unconditional, infinite love. And she had great faith in that, and that brought her great consolation. Um, so she was able to, to live in that truth and not to, to become um, wounded by that rejection that she experienced from her parents. So as she grew, that her parents heard about some miracles happening in a nearby town of Costello. And they thought perhaps this would be their chance um, for their daughter to be cured, then they would accept her if she were cured. And so they snuck her out of the castle and they took her to the tomb of this other saint that um, there were reported miracles happening. And they brought her to that tomb, and they, they prayed there and asked for a miracle. But as the day went on, they realized nothing was happening. And so they abandoned her there. They left her um, in that town without anybody knowing who she was, without any means to, to um, provide for herself. So it was like she was abandoned a second time in her life. And yet again, it did not breed resentment or anger or anything. She was able to have a very cheerful disposition and she started begging on the streets and was even taken in by some of the Dominican tertiaries or, uh, and they taught her how to um, tend to, the, to others. So she found ways to serve other people when she herself was suffering from disabilities. It, her disabilities did not prevent her from living the fullness of her life. So she was able to give even when most people would think, well, maybe she could only receive, but she found ways to serve other people. So, she also, like Zetislava, had a, a great heart for prisoners and those who um, were suffering in that way. So there's a story of a man who had been in, imprisoned unjustly and she went to plead with him because he had grown despondent and started to blaspheme God. And so she um, pleaded with him and her example led him to return um, to the faith. And um, so her heart went out to anybody else who was suffering. And I think the truth that um, Margaret's life embodies is the truth of the dignity of every human person no matter what our apparent um, deficiencies or lack of or our, our disabilities that every single person is made in the image and likeness of god and has inestimable value and she could live in that truth about herself even when she didn't experience that on a human level she knew that she was valuable because she um, had that dignity that was rooted in God, not in any human affirmation, but in the very love of God. And because she was able to see that in herself, even though she was blind, she could see better than most people. She could see God in other people. And there's the great beatitude, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So she was able to see her own goodness and the goodness of others because she had that purity of heart. She would often say, if you only knew what is in my heart. And they found inside her heart three pearls, and each of the pearls had um, one had an image of Christ, one had an image of Mary, and one had an image of Saint Joseph. 
And so even though she didn't have a human family that welcomed her, um, the Holy Family was in her heart that whole time. And so she found a, a haven of love in the Holy Family and in her Heavenly Family. And I think she invites us to, um, to discover our own dignity and our own value that is not rooted in what the world might say about us, but in what God says about us in our truest identity. So we can look to these saints, uh, especially these Dominican women saints, and all the saints really, um, and the example that they give us of living in the truth of who we're called to be, and that will make us free to love um, to the fullest of our ability to become like God. So we'll just end with invoking these two saints that, uh, that have, we've looked at more particularly and asking them to help us become saints ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, by her married life and works of charity, you taught St. Zedislava to pursue the way of perfection. By her prayers, may family life be strengthened and be a witness to Christian virtue. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And for Blessed Margaret. Compassionate God, you gave your divine light to Blessed Margaret, who was blind from birth, that with the eye of her heart she might contemplate you alone, by the light of our eyes, that we may turn from what is evil and reach the home of never-ending light. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you so much for letting me um, walk with you in this uh, journey with the Dominican Saints, and know that I'll be praying for you as well. God bless you. Thank you.